Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from different parts of the world and continents. Uh, this is another Sunday cultural storytelling session where we share our lifestyle, food, travel, history, people stories from a local perspective. Today, it's quite special because finally, we are getting into the territory of Africa. Uh, we are very, very lucky to have Juanita, who lives in Tunisia, North Africa. So I am going to spotlight Juanita for everyone. Hi, Juanita. Can Hello. you, can you um, briefly introduce yourself? Where are you from and where are you now? What you have been up to? <laughs> That's the big question. Um, uh, I'm from Vancouver, Canada, and uh, lived there my whole life, the rainforest, and uh, went from the rainforest to the desert, the complete opposite. Um, and uh, I've lived in Tunisia now for over 14 years, nearly 15 years. And um, I will talk a little bit more about how I got here and uh, why I moved here. Um, when we start the presentation. Fantastic. Um, I love the background of your room. It looks really cozy and exotic to, to me. Compared this to is the house I built. And actually, I um, it's a story in itself, the building of this house. <laughs> I'm <laughs> laughing, but but yeah, it's a it's a, a cultural story in itself. So I built it uh, during the, the Tunisian revolution and the wall behind you, I grouted by hand, literally by hand myself and uh, cleaned the cement on the outside of the wall and the inside of the wall. The long story, but- uh, We have to invite you for another session. I'll kneel <laughs> you down for this one. Um, before we start the wonderful presentation, you, you shared a photo and video with us and you're gonna tell your story. Can we just try to understand a little bit about the demographics in Tunisia? Uh, who are Tunisians? Are they black and they Jewish or are they Arabs? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And, and before we even get started on this, that, I'm, it's very fitting that since this is the first country in Africa, the word Africa was named in Tunisia. So the Romans, when they first came, they, when they came to Tunisia, um, they called it Yafrik. And it was meant for the whole land. And that evolved into Africa. And then Tunisia broke off and, you know, now it has the name Tunisia. But originally, Yafrik, Yafrika was, was um, all of Africa and it originated in Tunisia. So this is a perfect place to start Africa, actually. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. And Tunisia. So, yeah, the people of Africa uh, or of Tunisia. Um, it's really interesting. And it took me, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, you know, people get mixed up Bedouins and Berbers. What's a Bedouin? What's a Berber? Um, are they the same? Uh, so I will talk about, uh, there's about, other than expats or Western people, you know, there's a few Western people living here. But the, the main population is the Arabs, of course, and they're the ones that came down and took over. Uh, um, and they're the main part of the population, but they're more in the north. In the south where I live and where most of our tours are, it's almost like a different country. It's, uh, it's like going back in time. Um, so as well in Tunisia, there's a huge Jewish population. They've lived here longer than the Arabs. Wow. Uh, in fact, um, uh, there's a synagogue that um, was, is considered to be one of the oldest synagogues in the world. And um, it's a pilgrimage site for many Jewish people. It's one of the five pilgrimage sites to, on the island of Jerba. So yes, it's a, there's a strong Jewish population here, uh, mostly in Tunis and Jerba. And then there's also um, a, a large amount of black people and that came from the slave trade. 
Now the Sahara Desert, as you know, was part of the Silk Route and where, where spices and, and slaves and salt got brought up by camel through the Sahara up to the ports um, to Europe and China, you know, so all through to China. So that was part of the route. It doesn't get recognized or noticed as much because people always know the China to India to, you know, that part of the Silk Route, but the Sahara Desert was an integral part to that. And um, so there was, when slavery ended, there was, you know, a significant amount of Black people that ended up here in the North. And now they're, they're, they're Muslims, they're Tunisians. They've lived here for generations now. So, so um, yeah, there's a lot of Black people. And then um, there's Berbers. Now, Berbers are the original people of North Africa. Um, so they're the Aboriginal people. Some, there's more Berbers in Morocco and Algeria than there is in Tunisia. Um, Tunisia, they don't have uh, a written language, just an oral language, and they have signs, symbols. So when you go to old Berber um, houses and buildings, you can see some of these symbols, and I'll talk more about that later. But they're the first people of Tunisia. Amazia is the, the tribe of the, of the Berbers here. And then there's Bedouins. Now, Bedouins are also Arabs, but they're not the same Arabs that came in and conquered. They lived as nomads for, for centuries. In fact, the Bedouins of, of the South here um, have only lived in, they're now semi-nomadic. So they've lived in villages half and half for a generation, a generation and a half. So some of our Cameliers were born in the desert. They were, uh, I'll talk to you about one of them who was a nomad for 35 years. So there's still uh, a strong connection to the Sahara. In fact, the, the Berbers and Bedouins of the South have more in common than the, the Bedouins have with the Arabs, even though they're the same blood, because it's a Southern culture. It's a simple way of life. It's the um, very basic way of life. The North is much more modern. Oh, Juanita, just with these introductions and briefings, I'm fully convinced you lived there for 15 years. And <laughs> <laughs> you really can represent that local perspective. Oh, thank you, uh, thank you. Would you like me to share the slides now so you can start? Yeah, yeah, let's Basically, do that. There are three parts of the presentation and uh, for people in the group, whenever you have questions, feel free to type in the chat box so that uh, we can take opportunities uh, to answer your questions. Are you now seeing the slides, everybody? Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah, so, we're seeing the first one, yeah. Great. So there are three parts of the talk today. Uh, first, I actually asked Juanita to share with us her story, why she moved there. <laughs> so um, this, is, this is a picture, I'll give you a little bit of background. This is a picture of myself, obviously, and my first camel. That was 15 years ago. Um, I bought him to show how much I loved camels <laughs> long before I moved here. I bought him a year before I even considered moving here because, because I've loved camels and deserts and Arabic culture my whole life. I was also a belly dance instructor in Canada. Uh, I was a social worker during the day and a belly dance instructor at night. But um, so there was a lot about the Arabic culture I've always liked, but camels has always been something I just adored. Um, they're, to me, they're the complete opposites. They're ugly and beautiful. They're graceful and awkward. They're haughty and humble. Like every opposite word you can think of that describes a camel. So this camel, Lasfar, he's no longer with us. Uh, I was devastated when he died, but he was my first camel. So my first camel trek as a, as a tourist, um, I came here, I think it was 2006, and uh, Meki, who now works with Saha Sahara, he was a camel ear, and this was his camel. I fell in love with Lasfar and the Sahara, of course, even more so. 
And um, before I left, it was a 10 day trek, camel trek. Before I left, I said to Mackie, would you let me buy him? Because I can't see myself living the rest of my life and not owning a camel. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you take care of him. You know, he'll live here and I'll come and visit him, but he'll be mine. And so, of course, he was happy to do that. And, and I knew that last four would be loved and taken care of and, and that he was mine. So then I, I did move here a year later and, and uh, he became mine a little bit more officially. But yeah, camels were uh, a, a large draw. In fact, one of the reasons why I ended up moving here, I always knew I would leave Canada. I love Canada. But um, I'm the youngest of eight children. My parents were born in Russia. They lived through the Russian Revolution. I won't get into all that. They moved to Canada. So my paternal family, especially my, my grandparents, my uncles and aunts, there was such a rich, rich culture and strong family ties, but also just a rich culture. And when they passed away, it just, I know Canada has a lot of culture, but it just, it felt like there was something missing for me. So I always knew I would leave Canada. So it was just a matter of where. I fell in love with Turkey. Not, I never considered moving there, but for one of the reasons there wasn't enough camels. That was, that was, that was a picture for me. And there was no, not really a desert. So, uh, so let's see, should we? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is a video of my second camel who was, I still have, he's a racing camel. He's actually an Algerian Touareg camel. And the saddle is different than what we have on normal tracks because there's nothing to hold on to on this saddle. I'll tell a little bit more when you, when this video is finished. The quality is terrible. But... Well, Juanita, you just give me the idea for my next Christmas gift. What? I'm going to ask my husband to give a camel. For <laughs> Great. There you go. <laughs> okay, so this next, uh, so when I was talking before about um, I lost so much with my, with when, when my uncles and aunts and, and grandparents died. Seeing the people in, in Tunisia, especially South Tunisia, you can see by this woman's face, I, and you can't see, but it just touched something with me that reminded, it just fit into place. I felt like I had known these people all my life. Um, I would meet people on the street, and especially old people, they just they have so many stories and I just smile and we gravitate towards one another and hug. And so that's another reason why I, I fell in love with Tunisia is the, is the people. Yeah. So we got a couple of questions here. Yeah. Would you be able to answer? Number one is from Stephen. Population of North Africa would be different prior to Islamic expansion in like 18th century, surely, surely is, did you? Yes, yes, it is, was very different. I mean, the, the history of the people that have lived here, it's just unbelievable from, you know, the Carthaginians to the, uh, the Romans, to the Vandals, to, I mean, pirates. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, if, if you're looking for a, a history, um, uh, all the information on the history, I'm not going to be able to do it. I'd have to look it up myself <laughs> because it's so full. The, the second question is uh, slightly easier. From yeah, living yeah. on here in Singapore, what's the price range for a camel? <laughs> ah, okay. That's that's. That varies from year to year, and it's it's like anything. It's it's uh, availability, and you know, 
how, what what's available in it and how many people are wanting to buy and and what the economy is like. Um, when I first bought last far, he was this was like 15 years ago or 16. He was. I think I paid a thousand dinars for him, which is I know in Canadian that's about five hundred dollars. I don't know what that is in UK. Mm -hmm. And then they they went they've gone down and they've gone up, but it also depends on the age. Um, it depends on uh, whether it's a male or female, and uh, so now you can they go they run range anywhere from a thousand dinars to ten thousand dinars, depending on what you want. I mean, the age is also important because anything under four years old, you technically shouldn't be working them before then. So they're not making any money. So you're feeding them and camels eat a lot. So of course, a younger camel is going to be cheaper because you have to pay for the food. <laughs> I guess we got we get a, one more question about a camel. Yeah. How do you train a camel? I, not me. <laughs> I leave that to the experts. If I uh, had to train a camel, I think it would probably be the worst camel in the world. It's, wow. it's very interesting on treks, though, to watch them. Um, all the cameleers, I mean, that's one of the reasons I've picked them is, I mean, other than all the other skills and kindness and everything else they have, but loving their camels and being good to their camels because I'm such an animal lover is really important to me. So they, they teach them in a way that's very, you know, they, you have to be strong with them, but loving with them. So first they, uh, they find another camel for it to bond with. Let's say, say you've got a baby camel, you find an older camel for it to bond with, one that's going to be on the tracks with them on a regular basis. So it just comes and it's free. So it comes on the track, it's not tied, but because it's bonded with this adult camel, it won't leave. So it always stays by. So it gets used to traveling with other camels. Then, then uh, eventually they'll um, put a, a muzzle on it and a rope. Now that's the hardest part because they don't like that. And it depends on the personality of the camel as well. Some of them are easier than others. And then eventually they'll just put a saddle on them. And so it's a slow process to get them to actually working. So ideally you want to start them about two years old just to come as, you know, for a vacation on a trek. And then eventually by four, they'll be maybe carrying guests. Great. Does that answer your question? We're learning a lot about camels. <laughs> but next year we will have a lot of cam camels as pets. Oh, I tell you, I could do five talks just on camel <laughs> trivia. <laughs> so would you like to continue for the second part of your yeah. talk? So that's local culture. How's okay? Go ahead. So why your question was why? How is the local culture different than than mine was in Canada? Well, I mean, just looking at the picture, it's very obvious. But the next section, I have some really funny stories of my first years here in in the south of Tunisia. Now. I have to also um, digress a bit and say when people move to Tunis or Sousse or some of the bigger places in the north, their experience is very different than mine living in a Bedouin village of 200 people in the south of Tunisia. It's a completely different experience. So, um, you know, you'll probably hear, oh, Tunisia is modern. Yes, it is. And in many parts of it, it's very modern, but there's also pockets of it that people live very traditionally. Um, so this picture, the, the woman on the right, right behind the, the um, little boy, she's no longer with us. This was our, I was telling you about Meki, the, the guy whose camel I bought, that's his grandmother and she died. She was just such a wonderful woman. She has nothing to do with the story I'm telling, but it was a good picture. So my first year living here, I got every, does everyone know what Ramadan and Eid is? I know Ramadan, but not really. Yeah, it's Ramadan right now. So Ramadan is the month of fasting. And then Eid is the three days. There's two Ram There's two Eids. One Eid right after Ramadan, which is coming up. And then there's another Eid that's uh, around in November, roughly, every year. 
So that's the one where people will kill a sheep if they can afford it. Most families traditionally kill a sheep and, and then they dry it or whatever they do to make it last as long as they can. So an Eid is the Eid after uh, where people buy a sheep. It's a big deal. The kids all get new clothes and it's, a, it's, it's like Christmas. It's like Christmas is to Western people. So I got invited to an Eid party. So I went to this family home. There's a courtyard in the middle of the house and there's people all over and I'm talking to people. And in the back of my mind, I kept hearing whack whack like a thumping noise and I didn't pay much attention because I was talking to people and finally it got a little quiet I went and sat on on uh, a step and just started looking around where was this whack 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 coming from and seated seated royally with her outfit like this on the middle of the of the cement on the on the courtyard this big Bedouin woman, these are Bedouins, by the way, a big Bedouin woman, legs spread out. Between her legs is a sheep head that I hope no one gets grossed out, a sheep head with an ox embedded in its head. And she's whacking this, this uh, sheep head on the cement, trying to crack it in half so she can roast it. And at that <laughs> moment, you know, it hadn't been that long ago that I was in Vancouver. And I looked around and I just thought, how did I get here? <laughs> this was my reality now. This was my life. And it was just one of those moments that. Sorry. It just, you know, I had to shake my head. So that was one of my first experiences of how this culture is very different. <laughs> Nothing gets wasted, by the way. The, the animals are all free range and being an animal lover, I had you know a hard time at first with the idea, but I've seen how they're killed. I've seen how they live. They live a happy life, it, you know, and then they have a bad day and, <laughs> and then they become dinner. <laughs> I actually raised sheep and goats for about three years. So, and there was one time I was hugging one of my sheep, Emma, and I was smelling her and I all of a sudden I smelled barbecue and I said, I'm sorry, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we can see the next video then. This is a desert party. And you can see the stations where, and they just automatically organize themselves into who's going to be baking the bread. We brought a goat with us and the goat has been butchered now, so you'll see that. This is Sufi music. So that's it for that one. So if you want to go to the next uh, picture, uh, maybe before we go on to the next part of it, does anybody have any questions about killing sheep and goats or anything that <laughs> wasn't that part of the... I think we're good. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so uh yeah the next part of what's different is obviously the people that live here so these are three berber men 
And uh, there's specific Berber costumes or clothing and Bedouin clothing. But now since they've lived together so much in the South, they kind of wear each other's, depend on what they need. So the man on the right is wearing what's called a kashabia, um, which some of you know more from Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> People come here and say, oh, they've got Star, Star Wars things. And I say, no, Star Wars took their things. I <laughs> see. <laughs> and then the shesh is the, the headscarf in the middle. And uh, the man on the left is wearing more of a tradition Arab, Arabic hat, which is a shashia. Uh, mm. So we can go to the next picture. So this is Kharia. I've known her for since I first moved here and watched her kids grow up. Um, and since this, this part is, of the presentation is about how things are different, um, how the culture is different than, than uh, Canada, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious, but um, there's another funny story. When I, before I built my house, I lived in an apartment in Dues, which is the, the it's, a, it's, it's close to where I live now, very close but it's uh, about 35,000 people. So it's, a, it's bigger, it's a town. So I lived in an apartment and it had stairs, a flight of stairs. And um, wanting to be a good host, I invited Hedia and her sister to come for a visit. So I was in my apartment and I heard this giggling and giggling and screaming, like, like laughing and screaming. And I opened my door and here was Hedia and her sister climbing up the stairs on their hands and knees. They had never, never climbed stairs before. Like that still shocks me. Wow. Yeah, so, and even though the stairs had walls on both sides, there was, you know, they couldn't fall to the side. They were petrified. I mean, they were laughing about it, but they were petrified climbing up. And for the longest time, she was afraid when her kids would climb up and down my stairs. It, so yeah, that's that's another story that really shows how different it is. So, so that's kind of the end of that section. Would you like to get on to why Sarah Sahara? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I have lived here. Go ahead, do the video. What a stunning video. Yeah, it is. We're so lucky to have that. One of our guests took that. He brought a drone um, from, from Europe and, and took that video for us. So, you know, when I first moved here, I mean, like I said, one of the reasons why I came here was for the Sahara. And the longer I lived here, I lived here for four years before I started Saw Sahara. And was fortunate enough to explore areas where that most agencies don't take people and did expeditions looking for routes and, and uh, off the beaten track as, as, uh, as they say. And so that was one of the reasons why I wanted to start Saw Sahara is, you know, I thought so many people come here and most agencies just there's certain routes that they always do and they're nice but there's so many other places that are just incredible and that's what I wanted to share I started off sharing it with friends and family before I started Saha Sahara and then it evolved into Saha Sahara this is part of our team of Cameliers and myself um, next slide yeah next slide our next picture. Another thing that is really important to me is respect of the culture and sharing the culture and connecting people. Um, this was a guest son. They brought their, their two kids and we did a camel truck and then we stayed a night at a Bedouin camp. 
And this, this uh, boy is one of our Camelier sons. And so they spent the night there and the kids got to interact with the Bedouin kids. And this moment, it still gives me shivers. It was like this little boy, Najim, shared with the guests what he had that was a treasure to him, which was a beetle. And, <laughs> both, you know, it was such a boy thing. And it was just one of those moments where you can see two completely different cultures. You know, and it just shows kids are kids, people are people. Which language they use to communicate with each other? No language. And, you know, that's the thing I've, because these people don't speak English. Um, and most, and what's interesting is mo a lot of people in the South don't even speak French. Or if they do, it's just with, with guests. People who speak French are people who work with tourists. So a lot of the men who work in tourism, who are Cameliers, they'll speak French. But many, many of the women don't. But it's just surprising. And even when we do camel treks, um, our guests are primarily English. People find a way of communicating. You communicate through looks, through gestures, through sign language. And it's, uh, it's, it's unbelievable how people can find ways of communicating that's not in, in language. Shall I play the next video now? Yeah, and then I'll explain it. What's that? <laughs> So this is called zipta, which is which uh, literally means butter, but it's goat butter, and it she makes it look so easy. They put it inside a cleaned out goat skin that's made specifically for this. So they put the goat's milk in it, and they just kind of shake it and move it, and it's not. It doesn't take long. Pat it. I mean, I don't know what, <laughs> how they do it. Wow. And it comes and it's delicious. It's it's like a cross between a yogurt and a butter and you dip bread in it something to try when we travel yeah and and that's just also and she's in a bedouin tent there and it just shows uh you know how it's important to us to preserve the culture and so a lot of our treks and tours we really try and um integrate that into it so mm -hmm. we can keep the culture going we don't want the culture to die so now I'm going to be talking about we on on our treks. People have the option. It's the night in the Sahara, you will always sleep in a Bedouin tent. But if you go on another trek, you can elect elect to, to sleep in a Bedouin tent. Um, it costs extra because it it takes one camel to carry a tent. <laughs> They're very very heavy, um, and we also want to support the people who made them. So this shows um, how a Bedouin tent is made. They're handmade. And this is also a way of supporting the local people. All our saddle bags are handmade, the saddles are handmade, the, the Bedouin tent, it's all made by hand. And these are women in the community, men in the community, and it's all a way of supporting the community. So here's shearing sheep. And you can go to the next one. And the one on the left is my friend Haria, the one I told you about, and the one on the right is Fatma. And so they, I, I didn't show any pictures in between. So they she shear the sheep, then they clean, brush the wool, then they spin it, they spin it. It looks like a dreidel and they do it with their toe in a, in a I, it, I don't know how they do it, but it's unbelievable. So they spin it into a ball of yarn. Then they make strips of wool and it's a combination of sheep and goat. Sometimes it used to be camel too, but camel wool is very expensive now. And so they sell it if they can. Um, so they weave it into strips about half a meter wide. And then now this is towards the end, they're sewing the strips together, which will end up to be the Bedouin tent. So you can show the next one. Wow, it's beautiful. So that's two of our guests sleeping in a Bedouin tent. And that took two years to make. One tent. One tent. How long does it last? 
years and, and you can repair them years and years and years and years. Yeah. Does it keep? They weigh a ton. <laughs> So now here's a video of our team, the, the Cameliers. This was our 10 year anniversary video. We had a party. قابلنا الغزلان يرتبين اصحان شايش للفلان فخط وزرم اي عينت الختلان شافك يا ليبان زل بحني جيان جيت ابو العشم يا واي 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 حدثني الشيطان صور لي اللي تم لبس هكتان لبس هكتان وحده ما تلوان قرايب مرجان على صدر من الظلم يا غضايني صلي على اللي كرب الله يسلمك ظهري بسم الله ولا كان ندري الطب في ما يلقاها مرايات نعملها لباس عيون ايه ولا كان ندري الطب في ما يلقاها مريات نعملها لباس عيون حوم الفوت تجار نجل باها عناق ليلي ومن قدها من قدها الغنجر يقيقة حجاها علي بن حمد ديميتي مغبول تمنيت تمنيه هي في الخاطر عشير عماها ومغفور شعر ابو الغرور يقول يا حليا مريد دايم الغنج رقيق حجاها اللي هلبها يكوي جعب مقرول وكان موت التانت والسماح يفاها في ديار فنجين العسل مدفول وتخرج عليا يعفس ورجليها وللها ثنية قرون بعد قرون والنفس هانت هاينا وهناها على جور طفلة هو يا صاحبي مني عطيت عزيه وصدق الدمي على سميح اللون وكرسيت قال البنت عاشق فيها طفل عريضة زينها متنوم يا 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 طفل عريضة زينها متنوم وصدقتها وحطها على أساس عليها ومن الناس كفرة دونها مرفوض هريت زور خارج في الباس تعدر دفكح يخلص علي الفد خرج بخلاع العم هو جولتي بالوقطات الداعة وهزت قدايا عين هالا ياعك ويهذبها كي من طبع في القدة وشرشور دقلة في الغلف متاعة ومن حب ستة لخدم لصد خرج بجعارة ومثلت هالعم هو سودا نظارة قبطان والله بي حكم وزارة وبيعت لا بكلام رجع ضد صغير قسمها كبتي شطارة سود الحجين عم هو جتايه ند سود الحجين مثلها وسود الحجين السلسة نظيفة عظالها وربي يعطي من حازها وعقلها وغابر سواله من قديم ورد ويا رب سيدي قدرتك سهلها لصغير مرتاش لي مد ريت زول خارج في الباس تعدى ردف كحكي وخلص علي الفد يزيد Wow. So that was our 10 year anniversary party. So Just before COVID. <laughs> so do you, did you, which language they were using? Was it Chinese? Trans- Arabic. And do you, but there's But there's different dialects. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. There's different dialects of Arabic. The Tunisian dialect is very different than gen- generic Arabic from other countries, like Egypt has a very different uh, dialect. Not only that, but the north to the south of Tunisia, there's different dialects. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so completely different words, like uh, in the north, you'll say, um, even saying hello, in the north, you'll say, um, uh, how are, for how are you uh, in the south, it's uh, completely different words. We got so a- you can tell by the, where a person is from just by how they talk. 
the we words got a, quite a few we can understand each other hmm? we got quite a few questions yeah is it okay to have a q a time now yes a few questions and then i'll go on to the, the last part here have you seen a mirage in sahara is it always there at the same time same place yeah i mean there's there's lots of times even in the car like you've probably seen mirages in in other parts of the world when when the weather is really hot and the and you know the circumstances are just right you'll think you see something but it's not it's not it's not really obvious it's not um where somebody said oh there's a lake and there isn't a lake it just sometimes you think oh is that water ahead is that water ahead and you know there's not <laughs> what's the local language <laughs> The local, the, the, the official language is Arabic and the second language is French. And like I said, in the South, they speak a, a slightly different uh, dialect of Arabic. And then there's also the, the Berber language. Two thirds of the Berbers in the South, Southeast of Tunisia speak Berber in their homes. So yeah, it's Funny, very thanks different. for the patience. There are just more and more oh. questions coming up for you now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's your favorite local food? And is there anything you wouldn't want to eat? Yeah, I have my rules as far as what I won't want to eat. The people laugh at me when I, I'm, you know, I'm, I finally got strong enough to say, these are things I won't eat. I won't eat brain, even though it's supposed to be really good. Um, uh, but I know I just can't do that. <laughs> it's just too far away from where I came from. <laughs> And no, there's so many delicious meals. Uh, kusha is one of them. It's a we we have it on our trucks. It's a, baked in a clay pot in the in the sand, and it's um, lamb with rosemary and tomatoes and peppers and olive oil, and it's just like that. It's baked. It's delicious. <laughs> Melt in your mouth. I bet you just made everybody hungry now. <laughs> <laughs> um, if they are selling off whatever camel wool is available. Does it mean that a skill is being lost in the processing of it? That's a good one. Sorry, sorry I missed that question. Because you mentioned they actually sell off camera wools. Um, ah. So the question is, if they sell these wools instead of processing it, is that skill lost, being lost? No, no, I mean, it's not lost. It's just, there's, there's very little of it because there's only a certain age where you can use the camel wool, which is mm -hmm. when they're a baby. So it, it, there's not that much of it. And you know, a, a little bit of camel trivia that you might, you probably don't know is all the camels you've seen on this video. And, and if you go on treks, the camels you see will be male camels. So the male camels do all the work. The female camels live free in the desert. You'll see them sometimes wandering in the desert. You'll see them on the side of the road. So they live, in, they live free with their babies until their babies are about two years old. So, um, people that have male camels and that are camel ears it's like they, there's a different group of people that raise the females so the people that are all my friends basically are camel ears the ones that raise the male camels i know some people who raise female camels but um it's there it's a very different trait yeah um how often does it rain in Sahara Desert. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you can probably see by the pictures, not, not often enough. Um, coming from Canada, the rainforest, I mean, one of the things I hated about Vancouver, which is very much like London, is all the rain. <laughs> so um, when I first moved here, every time it would rain, I'd be like, no, no. And we've even had guests from UK, you know, they'd see it, it start to rain and they just freak out. And, and, you know, it took me years to realize no, it might rain for a few minutes, but it'll dry really quickly. And it's 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 basically, it's almost a non-event. In January, there is sometimes where there's like torrential rain pours, but that's like, that's it for the year then. <laughs> mm. So, oh, so many questions, Juanita, so many questions. I, I know you speak Arabic a little, so this question yeah. is related to language have you learned to speak their language uh, or do you undertake it to some degree the the local dialect of arabic has been really really hard to learn uh, first of all i'm i i ha i'm the first person to admit i'm terrible at languages so that's the first part the second part is there's 
there's almost no written books like lessons from Tunisian Arab, from English to Tunisian Arabic. So I would have to learn French too, which my I came come from English speaking Canada. So I had to learn everything I know. And plus I live in the South and that's where I had to, my priority was to be able to work with the people here. So that I had to just focus on that. So basically it was listening to sounds, um, asking people. So it's been a slow, slow, slow process, which is why after 14 years, my Arabic, I still haven't mastered it. Because you had to learn French first. <laughs> No, I didn't learn French first. I wish, I mean, it would have, it would have been, I started to do that, but then I realized it was going to take too long and it, it, it didn't work because the people here in the South only speak French when they're speaking to tourists. So I would try and get practice, but I don't speak it well enough to practice. So they would switch to Arabic. So it, it was just very confusing. So I just thought, no, I have to bite the bullet and just learn Arabic right from the get go. So that's, that's been my process. Wow. Right or wrong, that's the way I've had to do it. It's almost like a reborn process. It is, it is, it is, um, it is. How do you get internet in a 200 people village? Has it improved recently? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I mean, I have internet in dues here. Um, you know, it's like, it's like every, we have our brownouts, you know, where the power goes off. We have, you know, it's a third world country. And in the North, so you have the services are better, but in the South, they're not. So you have periods where it's just not that great during a sandstorm or a sandy day. It's not as good. So yeah, no, I, I couldn't live without internet. I think that's the one thing that, living so far away from my kids and you know that would be you know when I go off into the desert of course I don't have it but you know mm. at home I do so I know we still have one more part to to cover so yeah let's just um, let's do that yeah let's do that then um if people have questions um Juanita, is it okay for me to share your email address in the chat box? Yes. So can contact yes. You directly. Yes. Okay. So. And the website, you know, they can probably get a lot of answers from the website first and then yeah. the email is no, absolutely no problem. Yeah. yeah. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. So this, uh, this is, uh, his name is Ali Bashwisha. We call him Bashwisha. He was the man that was singing in the last video. He, this is a, he was a nomad for 35 years. 35 years he lived in the desert. Two years he spent without seeing another human being. He was in the desert. Like, try and wrap your head around that. Not seeing another human being in the, in the Sahara for two years. So the song that he sang in the previous video, that was a, a, he's a poet as well, obviously. He wrote that song while he was in the desert during that two years. And it's the most romantic song I've ever heard. It's all, all Arabic songs are love songs, or most of them, or love of the Sahara or a woman. But this particular one was a woman. And there's one phrase in there. I think if there's any guys who need the perfect romantic line, this is, this is from Bishwisha. When I die, I wish they will bury me in front of your doorstep so that I can feel your steps on me every day. That gets me every time. That's just so that was his song. And uh, I mean, he he he's the most amazing. The other Cameliers look up to him. He's just he's a legend. There will never be another guy like him. His 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 generation is dying. And with that skill, for example, we were on a trek and I've been in two desert actual sandstorms in the Sahara, two true sandstorms, many windy days where we need goggles, we bring goggles, but two sandstorms where you cannot see your hand in front of your face. You can't tell where the ground is because everything is swirling brown. So we were with a guest, lucky she, you know, I mean, she had the time of her life and she trusted these guys, but we couldn't stop because you can't set up a tent in that. So we basically, and Bashwisha was the head camelier. He's the head camelier on many of our, there's a couple of them on the longer treks. This was an eight day trek. And we went a, a day and a half trekking in one day 
we lost the group of camels in front of us, not lost them, but we couldn't see them much of the time. So the first group would wait for us until we got close. And that was Bashwisha. He led us. He found his way to where we needed to go. When people ask me, how do they navigate the desert? Some people say the stars, the moon, but that, that proved to me that I believe it's in their DNA from being nomads in the desert for generations and generations. There was absolutely nothing that could help him navigate that sandstorm. And I never, I wasn't afraid because I knew him already at that point. And I knew he would get us there and take care of us. I mean, these guys, uh, when we take people on a camel trek, I have to trust them with everything and I do. And he got us there, uh, absolutely no problem. And to me, that is just shows how how good he is. One of the expeditions we went on looking for um, new routes, we came to the top of a dune and Bashwisha sniffed his nose and he looked around, he said, they're making coal. That's a process sometimes they do in the desert, the Bedouins to make extra money. He said, and it's a smell of smoke apparently. He said, they're making coal, like I know they are. And the other Bedouins, the other Camelier said, oh, I don't smell it, I don't smell it. But Bishwisha said they're making coal. Two days later, we found them. And I couldn't smell it until we were like close to them, but he could smell it two days ahead of time. So to me, that just shows uh, such skill. So that's Bishwisha. We call him GPS Bishwisha. <laughs> <laughs> So um, this is this is one of our camel treks, one of our eight day camel treks. Um, you can see why I love the Sahara. Maybe you can't, but this is one of the reasons why I love the Sahara. Um, some of our guests and there's a GPS Bishwisha in the front there. And the next thing we're going to talk about is our tours. We, we do, we've evolved into tours of South Tunisia too, some of the places I've discovered. Oh, we're still on treks here. This is Alicia Nab, another one of our sage cameleers. He's wearing a handmade uh, wool cashabia. And next one, the night sky. Photo from one of our guests. We had two guests who were bluegrass singers from the States and they were doing a concert in, in uh, Scotland and they came and did a night in the Sahara with us before they went and they brought their fiddles. And it was hilarious to watch the Cameleers try and play the fiddle. So we had a real musical cultural exchange that night. It was a lot of fun. This is at the end of another track. So we really try and make a connection between, and that took me years because the Bedouins are generally shy. So I kept saying to them, no, the people want to meet you. They want to get to know you. So now they're slowly coming, getting, opening up more and more. Okay, now we're on to tours and people. So this is a, Bed a Berber woman and I've known her since my first time here as a, as a tourist as well. When I first met her, her oldest son, who's now 17, was I think around three. So I've watched her grow up, her kids grow up. She is the most amazing woman. When we do South Tunisia tours, whenever we can, we stop by her house and for a visit because it's great for people to meet a local Berber woman. This is a troglodyte house. So, um, I know we're running out of time, so I'm trying to speed this up a little bit. They lived in a troglodyte house, her and her family, for five generations. Uh, troglodyte houses are homes that are, there are Berber, oh, there's, oh, I could go and do another talk just on Berber architecture. <laughs> it's so hard to narrow it down. Um, Berbers traditionally built, because they were fleeing from persecution, they built what was available and what, and for the harsh weather. So a troglodyte house is dug underground. It's like a pit is dug straight down. And then from, from the pit, the sides are dug out into like cave rooms. So that helps with the heat. So they lived in one troglodyte house for five generations, fixed up with floods. That's another long story. And I won't get into it, but they had to leave their home from greedy relatives. 
So now this one here, her husband has built by hand. We've watched them build it from hand. So I've watched him with the pickaxe digging into the, into the soil. She's an amazing woman. Um, my, my expression is to, lo to know Saliha is to love Saliha. She's just a wonderful woman. And uh, we try and on our tours and our tracks, of course, we, we try and support local communities as much as possible. So even on tours, we will hire local guides to take people to specific places that live in those places. Um, so this is Anis. He's in the Mosque of the Seven Sleepers in South Tunisia. Next one. And uh, this is in a 12th century Berber mountain village that's still inhabited since the 12th century. Oh yeah, I could, anyways, um, I, it's so hard for me to stay on track and not digress. Uh, so we, we really try and support family run um, restaurants, hotels, whenever absolutely possible. And then we've just got one more short slideshow. This is a troglodyte house. This is Saliha's tr troglodyte house. You can see the pit dug straight down. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, and they live in like that. That's how that's their home. This is the village I was telling you about. People have lived there since the 12th century, the Berbers. What's and his they, height? They, it's not painted or anything strategically because when the Romans and the people like were after them, they had to hide in the mountains. So so um, they they had to blend it in with the mountain. So this is one of the places we take people to. And this is the Medina of uh, Tozer, another beautiful place in the south. Wow, this is absolutely mind blowing. It's an uncharted territory you showed us and your own story is also an uncharted yeah journey you had to navigate all yeah. of the <laughs> instincts. I'm still navigating. Yes, and, and the landscape you showed us, architectures and people are just extraordinarily beautiful. Um, we are at uh, one hour now. I don't know if yeah. everybody still has a few minutes because there are still so many questions. Um, when, when he died, I, I don't know if you would have extra five Five, 10 minutes to absolutely absolutely no problem I, I have i have one or two questions okay please please uh i noticed uh, all the camels only have one hump and they're camels with two humps yeah it seems like they'd be better to ride than uh, one hump <laughs> camel i have to be honest i've never ridden on a two hump camel so i can't tell you what the difference is but there's some people have said, because the camels here are dromedaries. So some people have said, oh, dromedaries aren't camels. The other ones are camels. Well, that's actually not true. There's two types of camels, like you said. The, the two humps are Bactrian, and the one hump is dromedary. Bactrian is more in Tibet, the Asian countries, um, where mostly uh, North Africa and the Arabic countries, and even Australia has the, the dromedary, the one hump yeah, camel. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. There are a lot of camels in Australia, and a lot yeah. of people don't realize that, but there yeah. are a lot. Uh, and you can actually go on treks in Australia. Yeah, yeah. I'm friends with a, a few people who have camel trekking business in Australia, and actually one of them was thinking of coming here, and I had to warn them because they have... They, they have a, a, a kitchen truck, you know, like it's very modern. It's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a great adventure, but they bring a truck with their own chef and kitchen and, yeah, yeah. you know, fridge. And, sure. and I said, you know, this, there's no fridges. There's no kitchen. There's no toilets. You, you, know, <laughs> you bring everything in and you take everything out. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, there's many, many camels in Australia. How do you find comfort in the extreme desert weather? It's actually not as, I mean, it sounds worse than it is. So in the summers here in Dews, it can get up to 55 Celsius. So that is hot. 
that is hot. I don't know what that translates anymore to Fahrenheit, but it's, it's very, very hot. But life is just different um, during the hot seasons. I mean, first of all, we don't take, do camel treks, obviously. Even the nomads get out of the desert in, in July and August. But um, you, you wake up early in the morning, you do whatever you have to do in the morning, and you have a long siesta. So I, you know, I watch some videos or I read a book or I have a siesta. I have an air, conditioning in, an air conditioner in my bedroom. So I shut the door. That's the only way I could survive. I'm a Western, you know, like there's just no way. I, I had to say long term. Yeah. Long term. Do I want to stay here or do I want to, you know? So, um, and then around, and the whole town, everything is shut down in the middle of the day. Like if you walk around uh, Deuce, the, the next bigger town in the middle of the day, it's like a ghost town. You know, you see some things blowing around the village and that's it. Um, and then around 3 30, 4, depending on, you know, how hot it is, everyone comes out again and then stores are open late and, and people are up late and it's just a different, different way of life. It's not, uh, yeah. It's really um, answering to nature. If nature asks you to stop working, it is. do that. It is. It's very much, you're absolutely right. And when you go on a camel track, it's the same thing. You, you know, you, it's very interesting um, process to release to, to let go, to go on a track and say, what's going to happen is going to happen. What the weather, I mean, you can sort of predict. And when we, when we do camel treks, we, we try and do it at the best season. We tell people, um, but you can't predict it. This isn't club men, right? So when you go out there, it's like you have to surrender yourself and go through the process. And it's, a, it's, a, it's actually very interesting and it's yes. a good thing to let go of technology, let go of all those things. Absolutely. And um, it's, uh, it's for us to know only in very limited time and space, we, we can overcome the challenge imposed by yeah. nature in broader sense. Yes, yeah. yeah. we have to obey. Um, one question from Stephen about local language, how does one define progress if layers of local language might be disappearing because of economic forces? Are they disappearing? Um, I don't think, I don't think they are because they're so immersed in the home and people still live in extended family. And I'm thinking of like the Berber, I mean, maybe in time, I, I see other things disappearing like the, the job of cameleer, for example. I think a, a generation or two from now, there won't be camel tracks the way I know it. Um, and that makes me feel sad. And it makes me also feel very lucky that I'm living here during that time. But as far as language, um, for example, in, in the Berber villages, yes, in the North, everything's modern and changed. But unless that changes in the South, the, but if people still continue to live the way they live, um, in the homes, they learn Berber. They go to grade one, they learn Arabic. By the time they're uh, grade, I don't know what grade it is, I can't remember, four or five, they're learning French. And grade eight, they're learning English. Those kids know five languages. <laughs> that's, wow. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> but the first thing they learn is Berber in their home. And the same as the Bedouin dialect of, of, of Arabic. Um, I, when we meet Algerian uh, nomads in the desert, I understand them more than the Arabic in, in Tunis because it's all desert kind of dialect. Do they have Starbucks over there? No, I wish. <laughs> Starbucks. I hate when I was in Canada. Uh, I, was such a I, probably like, I, 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 I probably couldn't survive. See, I probably couldn't survive. But if they got one here, in fact, I, I saw one on, on um, I think, I don't know if it was Instagram, but I Googled it and I said to my friends, and we were in Tunis and I was in my car and I said, oh my God, there's a Starbucks. So we use Google Maps and we're driving everywhere. We drive past it three times, like, no, where is it? Where is it? Well, somebody had called their their cafe Starbucks. So that was the big moment of the day. <laughs> I thought you had a mirage. <laughs> and I was not happy. <laughs> uh, um, 
so thank you so much, Juanita, for showing us a word we, at least I am least familiar with. I put down Juanita's website called sahasahara.com and her email address in the chat box. So if you have follow up questions or in the future, you'd like to understand more or travel to South Tunisia and doing her tours and tracks, feel free to access her website, Sarah Sahara. Uh, thank you thank so you. much. And thank you all for listening to my stories and I hope I didn't put too many of you to sleep. <laughs> thank you. Absolutely no. You raised so many questions and curiosities from us. Um, for everybody in the group who's still here, uh, our Cultural storytelling started exactly one year ago. Um, some of us were looking for things to do during a lockdown and decided to do this once a week. Okay. A free session to share our lifestyle, food, travel, history, inviting inspiring people like some of us in the group to talk about their passion. Coming Sunday, we will have a special event that is to celebrate uh, our one year birthday. It's a very small baby still at its infant stage, but we just want to thank everybody for traveling with us together for 51 times um, during a special year. And uh, there are a couple of games and uh, Gary will lead us to play. <laughs> uh, there's also a very, very interesting panel discussion Ploy is organizing. Ploy, do you want to say a few words about it? Yes, we are going to have a panel discussion um, with six panelists um, from Japan. Sumili is here um, from India, I believe. Praveen is still here. And um, we have one from the UK, um, Adam, one from the US, Kat, um, and one from Mexico, um, Ricardo. So um, we are gonna um, we are gonna have six of them um, doing the panel discussion and then talk about the future of travel. So I hope you can join us and Minji is gonna help me facilitate the discussion as well. And Min Minji is gonna talk about the future of our group. Yes. So uh, Pro is gonna facilitate a panel discussion with six speakers from four continents to share how they with last year's situation, mainly in tourism, and how does that impact their business, their lifestyle, and share their vision for the future. Uh, also, I want to take the opportunity to thank all of us who donated uh, to our campaign. Uh, with that, I think so far we have got about 800 pounds, a little bit over a thousand US dollars. Uh, I will do a small sharing about how we spent the money and how we plan to spend the money uh, for the growth of our community and the support uh, tourism industry for certain countries and places. Uh, we will also talk about some interesting new initiative to uh, in the future, how we uh, will grow digitally and grow in more regions and the locations. So stay with us, please do join us for some fun games, uh, fascinating panel discussion to hear perspectives from the globe and our um, trajectory for the future. Uh, again, thank you very much, Juanita. Thank you, Minji. Thank you, it was great. Thank you. Great work, yeah. Really, Thanks, I, wish, I wish you the best and all of us wish to see you and your friends. Uh, yeah, keep in touch. One day, yeah, in the future. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>